dissenters, people who go against the grain in a, in a classroom conversation or in another setting, they're, they're actually adding value. They're doing us a service. They might be the people who care the most. Uh, Megan, I'll ask you sort of from a, a graduate student perspective, I have a feeling that's not the conventional wisdom in a, in a lot of uh, academic classrooms these days. It's, it kind of gets framed a little differently, doesn't it? I think so. Um, I don't think that a lot of students believe that they're against free speech or viewpoint diversity. Um, I see a lot of students believing in free speech to an extent, um, and some might place more limits than others. Um, for context, my background is, yes, graduate student, Ivy League, but I was in community college. I transferred to a public university and then now getting my doctorate at a private. And what I've noticed around is that, yeah, I think students, they are uncomfortable speaking to ideas generally, even very left-leaning students. I had to approach me in my own office hours this past semester, and not that they wanted to express a very conservative idea, let's say, or they had something that they thought was going to offend someone. They were afraid in general of speaking an opinion because they didn't know what kind of reaction they were gonna get, even though they were very left-leaning typically. Um, and I think that is the context that we're operating in is a very left-leaning environment. Um, and so you have students who are still left of center, not knowing what to do, not knowing what to say. And what I wanna impress upon, you know, how do we change the social climate of the university um, to the question that you posed to Jan earlier, I think graduate students and adjunct faculty need to get a lot more involved. We talk about what faculty can do. We talk about what administrators can do to change the campus climate. And those are important classes of people. However, graduate students and adjunct faculty are doing a lot of the teaching on campus, um, sometimes the majority of teaching. And I've heard some very well-intentioned people give the advice to people like me, keep your head down, don't say anything too controversial, don't get called a racist on Twitter for saying something, whatever. And that advice is well-meaning, but we're teaching students now and I can't wait until I get tenure, probably because I'm not gonna get tenure because statistically there aren't the jobs for it. Uh, but I, I do want to see more grad students and adjunct faculty who are embracing viewpoint diversity actually do something about it and not just keep their heads down. If I say nothing else in this panel, that's, that's what I wanna get across. <laughs> Call to action, thank you. Um, so Kevin, I wanna make sure we, we bring you in here. I know that um, you've also written and, and talked about how the majority of students are, are against things like, you know, a willingness to commit violence when they disagree with a speaker. Uh, and, and you've looked at some of that data. Um, you're also a, a political scientist. What's your what's your take on on this issue of of peer pressure and, and viewpoint diversity and how they're interacting on campus? Yeah, I think uh, I can respond to what some of the other panelists have offered already. Um, the first thing I would say, and, and I'm coming from a perspective of somebody who's sort of pathologically obsessed with data, so um, it, to the extent that that's uh, that's helpful in this conversation, uh, I'm I'm probably have something to offer, but. Uh, just firstly, on, on Jay's point, I would push back a, a little bit against the idea that this is a relatively small group of people. I think um, the size of, of, of the group of people who are willing to engage in censorship is um, often surprisingly large. And more importantly, it's not evenly distributed around the uni university. I think one of the things that's been really um, helpful over the last couple of years is for the first time we have survey data, survey data about how faculty members think, about how students think. So we've we've approached this the sort of quote unquote free speech crisis in a kind of um, as a disaggregated or sort of rather a, an overly aggregated problem where we we assume that every university has the same challenge every um, every part of the university has the same challenge so that means faculty and adjuncts and administrators and we assume that every student and student group is is kind of uh, dealing with the same problems and i think that the the data actually points us in a in a quite different direction i think it's productive as we start thinking about solutions to what we imagine this problem to be uh, to sort of look into that so uh, just to to jay's point this is not a survey of of and i'll post it in the in the link it's not a survey of college students but uh, in 2021 65% uh, of strongly liberal 
uh, people, people I self-identified as strongly liberal, reported blocking somebody or reporting to somebody on social media. Uh, that's compared to 40% of, of people who identify as strongly conservative. And this is a pattern that, that we've seen uh, sort of play out in a variety of different domains and contexts. And I think it has to do, again, with fundamental differences about liberals and conservatives, uh, a focus perhaps on harm or justice or fairness, as opposed to uh, a concern about, about liberty and freedom and equality. And I think what we need to start doing is recognizing that we have a kind of series of crises that are embedded in each other here. Uh, we have kind of a free speech crisis that's embedded in uh, what I would argue is kind of a mental health crisis, which is further embedded within a friendship crisis. And some of uh, Heterodox's Academy's uh, own survey data sort of points us in the direction of this. Um, students who interact with others less frequently are far less comfortable communicating their opinions on campus. And when we start looking through the data about friendship, particularly for young men, uh, nearly 20% of young men report not having a close friend, uh, the, the number is slightly lower for women. But we have this, this uh, again, sort of lack of interaction, let's say, that, that I think exists um, within the purview of, of universities to try to encourage. I think it's useful for us to think about solutions in this way. But I also really want to be attentive to the fact that, that the mental health struggles that, that our students are confronted with, I think everybody who's involved in any way in a university uh, experiences this quite profoundly. This is not entirely disconnected from some of the free speech issues, some of the, the issues that we're sort of talking about more explicitly here. And I think we need to kind of consider them collectively as we think about strategies for how to solve some of these issues. Jay, you were mentioned there, so you can get in on that if you want to, but no pressure, no peer yeah, pressure. I, no, I appreciate Kevin, uh, you know, uh, adding nuance to my perspective. Um, yeah, so I, I was responding to some surveys I've seen where about 60% of students, six in 10 students on campuses from polls um, su support, think that universities and colleges should allow students to be exposed to all types of speech on campus. But that doesn't mean those people might say they support it and then in their private life, you know, block somebody on on Facebook, I've muted and blocked lots of people on social media over the years for all kinds of reasons. Um, and yet I generally support, you know, a, a broad discourse of ideas. So I would be maybe someone who would get caught as saying saying one thing, but maybe doing another. So I guess it also depends on how they mentally represent free speech and and so forth. Um, I tend to, th so, so I guess it's how you measure it, how you encode it, what it means to people. Um, people might, you know, still want to mute, you know, all kinds of individuals, even if they support, you know, a broad array of discourse on campus. I think this is also another useful point, which is it's useful to define what we mean. Um, and, and I would say the issue with extremists or people with very extreme positions is that they tend to score high on the most dogmatic beliefs. They become very rigid thinkers. They also score high in measures of belief superiority. They think they know better than other people. And so that makes those individuals, uh, I also say the data I study, social media, I do a lot of research on that. People who post the most toxic and hostile content online tend to be the most extreme. And it's not just that they post the most extreme uh, and hostile content, they post at a rate that's much higher than other people. Because people who are kind of have more nuanced or complex views or score higher in intellectual humility just tend to not post nearly as much. And so what, what, what happens when you have dynamics, especially in the online world, is you see also a false norm of, wow, it looks like people are more extreme than I thought, but that's because the most extreme people post by far the most and have the most followers and therefore dominate the conversations. And so I also think there's some dynamic where colleges and universities and classrooms sh should think about ways to surface a broader variety of ideas, including people who have more nuanced or complex uh, or you know, uh, visions of things that aren't just at seeing the world in black or white, whatever their belief system is. Mm -hmm.